Good morning to our data science crowd. It is now 1252 AM, May 2nd, 2021. You see all these numbers and coordinates popping up? This is actually a really interesting data being collected by the Centers for Disease Control called COVID-19 County Hesitancy in reference to vaccination. They rated the counties by two factors, estimated hesitancy and estimated strongly hesitant. So they found out counties, for example, which are virtually not hesitant at all, or not have anybody that's strongly hesitant, compared to those areas which I shall label, forgive me for taking the liberty for adding publisher bias, resistance. And they basically went through a ton of counties. You can get an idea by looking at these codes. They just basically cover just about every place. And we will look at this data a little bit more in detail if we cover the other articles. But for example, these are the areas which virtually have no desire to resist or no hesitancy. Again, you see how easy it is to interject publisher bias? Let's look, for example, California, Marin County, California, and San Francisco, so on and so forth. Their arms are arms, I sure I should say their arms are open wide, but reality, let's just put it this way, their sleeves are rolled all the way up, waiting for their vaccination in basically in heated anticipation. And so what we'll do is we come back to this after we look at the articles, we'll find out those areas which are highly resistant, i.e. hesitant to vaccination in a second, just by changing this number upwards. So let us begin with the research articles as we proceed and because they're really important. This one is probably one of the most groundbreaking articles in reference to pandemic mitigation, at least in reference to SARS-CoV-2 that I have read to date. And we've done this for 29 weeks straight. Now, this is really intriguing because it's not that difficult to obtain. And you easily, easily could uh, incorporate this in pandemic mitigation uh, areas, for example, schools and so forth, without creating any due course or making things overly uncomfortable. Let us proceed. Heat inactivation method successfully neutralizes coronavirus in less than a second. Now you think heat, you think, wow, like boiling temperatures, so on and so forth. Au contraire, not very hot at all. In fact, the temperature deactivates SARS-CoV-2 in less than a second is about the average temperature you'd find in a sauna, like a gym sauna provided we had those. But to proceed, here we go. Han said, if a solution is heated to nearly 72 degrees, now keep in mind, we're looking at ambient temperatures and things like that that could play a role in a lot of variability and so on and so forth. To 72 degrees Celsius, for those not familiar, we're taking a temperature, nine divided by five plus 32, I believe, uh, 160 degrees to 161 degrees Fahrenheit, about the temperature of a, of a sauna, for about half a second. It can reduce the virus to the quantity of the virus in the solution by 100,000 times, which is sufficient to neutralize the virus and prevent transmission. So here we go. Think of it this way. You're about, uh, you have a school, all right, and you're worried about a pandemic, whatever it is. You design a hallway. The hallway is based upon the measurement of how long it takes an average individual to walk one second. So you work it out, you know, the average person walking one second, how many steps would that be? You design the hallway where it basically projects heat, for example, at this, then obviously is ambient temperatures and a lot more variables, but to keep it simple, let's say 165 degrees for this one second walkway. Let's say we use infrared heat, all right, to make it even easier, if, that's, if that plays out to be exactly the same. Boom, SARS-CoV-2 neutralizes the area. Now, does that reduce the requirement for face masks and things like that for those people operating inside a school once they pass through this heat barrier? Don't know. But again, it's interesting to at least pursue. Now, if you combine that heat barrier, let's say with UVC light, 254 nanometers, I think you can use other safer nanometer on the UVC light as well. UVA in combination with UVB, basically sunlight, uh, in combination with the, the heat barrier, you got, or let's say even ozone, because ozone has been shown to work as well. You can create an incredible, incredible pandemic mitigation barrier on entry to any areas which are highly sensitive, i.e., let's say for schools, uh, long-term care facilities, hospitals, so on and so forth. It is simple 
and it's a lot cheaper than treating a person for the ailment that may succumb to it. It's a lot easier to prevent without having to do any weird things like dysbiosis by having people mask up, long sleeves, take an antibacterial soap, creating microbiome uh, disruptions, and so on and so forth. You get the picture, but amazing, amazing information. They are so nice, they actually went through the study itself to go through and compile the entire list of all the information in reference to not just SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, MERS, uh, they made the basically reference to influenza, just about any sort of uh, potential virus that can be creating a problem per se. And on top of that, in their words, the potential impact is huge. And it truly is. It just has to catch the eye of some policymaker out there that has the power to basically incorporate this and throw it in airports or whatever it comes down to be. If you could throw, I mean, seriously, these these x-ray machines in airports, my gosh, you could do this in a heartbeat and, and create uh, such a much more amiable environment that is not so restrictive of the person's freedom of movement as well as freedom of dress. But to proceed as follows, next one. Guidance and treatment of rare blood clots and low platelet counts related to COVID-19 vaccine. All right, but keep in mind, the researcher here is going to caveat it, saying you have a lot higher opportunity for having a blood clot, for example, uh, in this case, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, from COVID uh, data-wise as opposed to the vaccine. But they're not discounting the fact that the vaccine can't cause it. So they're weighing the risks out, but... The most important aspect of this, and this is for, again, more of medical professionals and researchers and so on and so forth, and not to, to interject too much paranoia into the equation, is they break it down onto how it may be caused the problem. And here we go. Now, this information came out after this article, and it's right here. And so it's a diagnosis and management of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis and vaccine-induced thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenia. All right, so here we are. This is the, the part that you want to look at the most. And you guys know I read everything. And here we go. So uh, let's not do the blue. That's going to make it almost impossible to read. All right, so CVST associated with vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. The Janssen and AstraZeneca vaccines contain replication incompetent adenoviral vectors, human, blah, 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 and chimpanzee, blah, 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 respectively, that encode the spike glycoprotein and SARS-CoV-2. It's believed that leakage of DNA from the adenovirus infected cells binds the platelet factor and triggers the production of autoantibodies. And again, it'll go more into detail uh, in reference to basically how things may occur the time things happen, and so on and so forth, uh, and how they basically recommend it against certain treatments. So I'm not going to read the treatments and what they are most really concerned about. Again, they will caveat it uh, in reference to basically the people have a higher, uh, a greater opportunity to have CVST with COVID-19 than from the vaccine itself. So sometimes it's difficult to extrapolate the data. Uh, but however, though, this will at least give you a good breakdown of how and what happens and potentially the reasons to why. Again, this is more for medical practitioners on the front lines in reference to treatments on what to do and what not to do. And this will go into the basic aspects of it with the caveats. Uh, and then this will go into the more the detail and diagnosis and management of it. And so no heparin products in any dose should be given. If that information can get out there and save a life or two, then again, it's worth it. You know, so I want to make sure that information comes to light and that people have proper access to the information because I know the field changes quickly and situational awareness is sometimes difficult to maintain. Henceforth, that's why I do this on a weekly basis. Even though we have a very small uh, crowd, it is still important to get out there regardless. Next after that, I tell you, they're going to be coming for your pets. 
I mentioned this back on week two, and it's still moving in that direction. Study and cover is human to cat transmission of the virus that causes COVID-19, and people do not want to hear this, and I agree with you. I don't want to hear it either. Uh, but they are finding that people have infected their cats with COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Now, what they are concerned about is this. These findings indicate that human-to-cat transmission of SARS-CoV-2 occurred during the the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK. Important aspect in reference to pandemics when pandemics are beginning to come to an end, there is a very, very subconscious aspect to it when people start talking about things in past tense. So start looking at the language, and when the language starts uh, alluding to a past tense, uh, basically time statement, just make a note. These findings indicate that human to cat transmission of SARS CoV 2 occurred during the COVID 19 occurred, see, COVID 19 pandemic in the UK, with the infected cats displaying mild to severe respiratory disease. Given the ability of the coronavirus to infect companion animals, it'll be important to monitor for human to cat, cat to cat, and cat to human transmission. And so, I'm, you know, remember the, the minks? Uh, that they had a problem with that and the, the mass culling. Again, I, that's why I really am trying to allude to people to, if they can, take better care of their health because obviously COVID-19 has been really reflective of a lot of comorbidities and that's being nice. And so basically, you know, if there is, if doing certain things like either avoiding certain things or keeping more exercise or being higher in nutrients without, you know, obviously alluding to any prescribing or diagnosing can benefit. I would go that route because pets are really, these companion animals are extremely important. And any way we could build pandemic barriers, for example, heat, UV light, so on and so forth. uh, Yeah, it's important because these pets, pets are people's best friends. And I want to make sure that that Rubicon is not crossed. So let's proceed forward. Cell study suggest pesticides. And this is really interesting too. Now you have to remember though, we come from a time when people would ask, well, why didn't you prepare for climate change? And I digress. And there's a reason for this. Well, back 1980s, remember 1970s when we had odd even license plates and things like that, when you can even fill up for gasoline, we were told that we weren't going to have any gasoline by the year 2000. So henceforth, there were no plans for climate change because they were, we were being told on a daily basis that we've run out of fuel, i.e. Enron, for those familiar with the case as well. And whether it be Freon or whatever it comes down to be, we were given you know, a lot of predictions, obviously never came to fruition, thank goodness. But here we're looking at Gulf War illness. Now, in the actual study itself, which was just released here, they noticed that individuals uh, that were veterans of the Gulf War uh, had a higher mortality rate than the general population, about 4%. And they wanted to realize why. Why was that occurring? Well, they started looking at especially organophosphates. And remember this. Remember General Schwarzkopf and Powell and all the other ones going out saying, oh, there's no such thing as Gulf War illness. It's all in your mind and things like that. Well, yeah, that's. I'm still angry. Let's put it that way, because we all know individuals who had to succumb to Gulf War, which were first told that it was just depression. In reality, it actually had some biochemical aspects. So that gives you an aspect as well. When the CDC and other health departments do selection bias, we're wrong. So again, your best people can be wrong often. But here we go. What we're looking at right here is this, and. This right here, the receptor for COVID-19 was more highly expressed in apical. I believe that's pronounced apical. If I'm wrong, please correct me again. Uh, when cells were exposed to organophosphates and interleukin-6 right here. And so what happens is you're looking at more ACE2, uh, the receptor was more highly expressed. And of course, with SARS-CoV-2, boom, boom, boom. The better the expression of ACE2, the more likely that's going to occur. Henceforth, the hypothesis and the conjecture that basically individuals exposed to pesticides have increased susceptibility to COVID-19 infection because the expression of ACE2. 
And I'm not going to get much more into it because it's fairly detailed, but it it gives you uh, room for pause uh, to find out why some individuals may be more susceptible than others. It could be, for example, if individuals are trying to figure out why Hispanics are more susceptible to it in certain areas, let's say, uh, or basically migrant workers or veterans that ex uh, experienced, um, you know, in elements of the Gulf War itself or anybody else, farm workers, uh, you know, you start looking for those, those aspects, those vulnerabilities. And in this case, for example, for those Gulf War veterans, 4% is much higher than the standard. Uh, and a lot of these people are not elderly that fought the Gulf War by any stretch of the imagination. For those that are familiar, we're looking just the early 2000. So that gives room for pause. So let us begin with the data as follows. And here we go, as promised. First data is the data being accumulated by the CDC in reference to whom is hesitant and who is not. All right, so the data right here we're looking at is basically from the data of the CDC. It comes out like this. Estimate hesitant, strongly hesitant, vulnerability index uh, as far as you know, delivering vaccines as needed and so on and so forth. Uh, percentage of population fully vaccinated. Again, racial elements, boundary lines, uh, level of concern for vaccine rollouts where you're gonna find the greatest resistance and so on and so forth. And here, for example, you see Wilcox County, Alabama, which pops up at number one, which is actually row one or row zero in this case. And you see 0 0.11 hesitant, 0.23. Ready for this? This this work, it's kind of interesting. We are gonna put it at, let's say 0.19. Now you're talking one fifth of the people are extremely strongly, extremely, I'm reiterating the words, extremely strongly uh, resistant or hesitant. So again, it's easy to think, uh, interject corp, uh, publisher bias, but to proceed, boom. Let's say, for example, whoop, there's Wilcox Alabama. Ah, up oh, one second. Let's get the rows going. And therefore, we want to make sure we go the max rows. And there we go again. And so here we go. And there's a lot of information here. Hang on one second. Make sure I get this thing. Gonna pause it real fast. <laughs> no, I, I don't have to pause it because I'm being an idiot. Ready? Because I'm doing less than, greater than. There, da, 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 here we go, see, boom, there we go. This is basically, we're looking at areas which are extremely hesitant, point two. Now this is really enlightening. Now, obviously we have the rows all the way, you know, we get all, maximum rows. Those familiar with uh, programming, 999 rows, well, we don't have that many, but look at the area which is most hesitant, the, 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 the resistance the uh, anti-vaccine fortress or anti-COVID vaccine. A lot of people are not anti-vaccine. They just, they just want to make sure the vaccine's safe before they take it. So this is all literally one state, just one state, North Dakota. That's ex estimated to be strongly hesitant. So CDC workers walking in North Dakota and looking to vaccinate people, they're not gonna get a lot of kind looks. All right, but just to make sure that our data is correct and not uh, uh, just uh, isolating or iterating to f land on just one state, right here we go. And so that means 19% of the people that were surveyed at least are to be strongly hesitant. Go 0.15, here we go. Now you see, now these are, now 15% now is still really strong. So these are all the areas, these are your holdout areas, including areas you wouldn't expect, like Tennessee, uh, Wyoming, Arizona. These areas are the areas which you have people which are estimated to be strongly hesitant. As you go down the list right here, this is where, you know, they would, uh, CDC, you know, a vaccine campaign may not take off. In fact, may even have an inverse effect. As opposed to, remember, we reversed this little thing, which I would, that, uh, well, went the wrong way the last time, but boom, now we're going less than, and we go, let's say 0.03. What do we come up with? Yeah, these are the places, again, they have their sleeves up, they're waiting, they dream about the vaccine coming to town, as opposed to the other route, way, way around, where basically 
yeah, you better not step foot in North Dakota if you plan to vaccinate people, it seems like. Again, that's my bias in reference to that. But let's look at the rest of the data as follows. That's basically an elaboration or in-depth look at the um, at this chart right here, uh, the hesitancy chart from the, uh, the CDC, just for those that need to know. Again, but let's proceed forward with the rest of the data as follows. We're going to go a little bit backwards, and, but we are going to move fast. All right, here, yep, that's it. We did that last week. All right, rebuild. Now, what we're going to do here is this. Uh, let's do this. Yeah, let's go here first. We're going to start from the bottom up. Now, I believe you go, according to the AARP chart, there are only 25 states uh, still having a mask mandate. And remember, in New Hampshire, it was the 16th of April. Now, we're using this for controls. We're trying to see if the mask mandates make any difference. So keep in mind that this is important because we're using real-world scenarios, not lab settings. So here we go, New Hampshire. And they took the mask off about April 16th, if you're looking right here. And it still looked like it had no impact uh, per se. It just it balanced out a little bit. So if you're a scientist or a biostatistician or epidemiologist, and yeah, you know the lab data in reference to masks, but you see how people wear masks. And don't even get me started with a person with a beard. I mean, for those medical professionals know what a beard and a mask combination, how effective that is, we don't have to go very far. Uh, so, but outside of that, boom, look at that. And, you know, masking kids, good luck. Uh, talk to any parent about that because masks can only really truly be as effective as the ability to seal the areas around the face. I mean, unless you're trying to do some sort of social conformity thing, yeah. So here we are. The mask things at April 16th, data-wise, there's New Hampshire, Vermont, heavy masks, New Hampshire not. And it's going to be more enlightening as we proceed forward. Here we are. Vermont, look at that drop down. This seems to happen regardless. So again, I'm not looking for correlation. I'm looking for some sort of causative uh, relationship. Here we are. And da, da, da. Oh, that didn't come out there. Green's supposed to be light. I just did this last moment. The green are all your states, basically, which dropped the mask mandate. And so for us, like here in California, uh, we don't know there's a world out here that doesn't have a mask mandate. And so, you know, and Biden did his 100-day promise. And not to knock Biden, but mm, uh, no. It's this, no, no, the rest of the world is not following. Where's North Dakota? Right there. Here's North Dakota next to one of the hot spots. And let's look at them in a second too. Let's, let's go up here. Do, 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 do. Uh, oh, let's go Wisconsin. And Wisconsin was covered uh, both sides by two hot spots. Let's see. Wisconsin. Right there. So here's Wisconsin between two states which have COVID-19 positivity rates skyrocketing and Wisconsin is down here. Why is that? So think about this. Wisconsin should be ravaged by COVID-19. Again, we're looking at this at a data analytic aspect, but it's not. And I know some people are going to hear this and go, oh, well, you know, this must be some sort of bias. That's why data science is so cool because numbers, now, there could be some conflation or data uh, collection information that could be a little different, but still, look at this. And that's that's all across the board. And this is cases per 100,000. So not going off the general population, we're comparing apples to apples. And here we go again. Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Wisconsin. Now, what's important about these states? Well, these states, for example, Indiana, Wisconsin especially, I've dropped the mask mandates. So we have some interesting controls. But Michigan, you have a drop here, but good luck. I'm proving to me that basically strong pandemic mitigation strategies um, or policies make any difference. They do make a difference in hurting people, but if people can be free, you know, you don't have to do something for the sake of doing something. But again, I'm not going to preach on that. I just want to get into the data. All right, so here we go again. Hospitalizations, Wisconsin. And again, point to Wisconsin quite a bit because they're between two hot spots, yet it seemed almost like Wisconsin was the buffer zone. Yet their pandemic uh, restrictions are far lighter than the other states. Minnesota, again, there's Wisconsin again. So here it goes, ba -ba boom Minnesota, 
North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. We're sharing the same y-axis, and we're looking at cases per 100,000. You're an epidemiologist. You're, it's kind of funny. Look at this. It, it, didn't, it did not mean to be this way, but the weirdest, the weirdest thing I just noticed is it had to be pure chance. Look at this right there. You see it almost like attaches like a puzzle piece. That's freaky, but that's just the way the numbers landed. That's actually quite bizarre, but that's just the way. North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin. Wow. It's almost like it's almost like the charts were attached, but they're not. But here they are. Boom, boom, boom. Next to that hot spot, you know, looking at Minnesota. And here are these people again. You have to look at collateral damage, you know, cancer diagnosis, surgeries, elective surgeries, people in medical clinics for, for heart disease, diabetes, so on and so forth. I don't know what that guy left here. I had a random dot. Sorry about that. And uh, so on and so forth. But yeah, look at that. It's just boom. Life moves on, unless you're in Minnesota. And keep in mind, 25, this is now green, represents no mask mandates. So it's like almost we have two different worlds, just two different worlds. And I guarantee this is going to play out in election politics as well. All right, so we go up the chart, and here we are. These are the um, hospital cases of hospitalization, no mask, loose restriction states. Uh, this information right here is the loose states. Look at the patterns. This is uh, patients hospitalized confirmed COVID. All right. Pretty high in January, this loose states. This is tight states, heavy duty pandemic mitigation. And they're rising. So much so, for example, this is our ratios. We're looking at that. Ratios. Right here, green, loose states versus white, tight states, COVID hospitalizations per 100,000. So we're comparing apples to apples. They're way above. They're actually breaking loose from those states, which basically dropped it. There we are. Green, loose states versus white states, COVID hospitalization per 100,000. Again, you have to argue the numbers. Don't not become emotionally attached. I did it in the beginning, and now it's, you know, but however, though, Michigan. Look at these states right here. These are tight states, tight restrictions. Um, you know, especially if you're in, you know, imagine your political leaders. I don't know. They're afraid because they're afraid because of uncertainty. They're afraid if they, you know, it's, but you can't play that game. It's like being afraid of flying. Is you, you've been, the, you're waiting for the plane to crash so you could say, look, I was right. And you know, you can't do that. Life has to move forward. And I know it's easy for me to say, but however, though, again, living less, I don't know if it's a good solution either. So here we go. You see that break right there? That is green, loose states versus white side, new deaths per 100,000. You see, now we're comparing apples to apples. Even if I say something that sounds unpopular, numbers are numbers. So we move up, and we're going to look at India, too, because I know India is being brought in the paper, too, and I've been reading some pretty superfluous headlines. Uh, new deaths per 100,000, that's a closer look from the beginning of April uh, to obviously the end of April. Uh, and let's see if there's any further data I want to embellish. Uh, new case per 100,000, rolling seven day. Uh, that is at 101 is the average on the loose restriction states now, or no mask mandates, versus 139. Uh, this is green loose states, case per 100,000 rolling. And going on, you get you already can see where it's heading. It's basically the area, now you could obviously make the argument saying, well, the states which have hardly any mandates, well, that's why they're loose because the disease is not ravaging their states. But however, though, we went way back. And remember when they said Florida would fall apart and things like that, and it just never manifested, thank goodness. Now, it doesn't mean new strains may come and cause more cases to arise, but remember, though, uh, a lot of the scientists predicted that the, the virus would become easier to transmit. This was said a long time ago, but have a lethality much decreased. And let's just let's visit that right now. Let's go to the, let's go to the world mass data. All right, this is where we have it. I think I have India popping up here. Here it is. So look at this. This is India. That's 2.5 deaths per million, which is quite a lot for India 
considering you're looking at a country of a billion people. All right, but here you go. There's your cases rising. Now, they have a new variant. I think it's B167 or 1617 or something like that. Uh, I forgot what the variant name was exactly, which is higher to transmit. But also, too, keep in mind, too, look at this. Test per thousand. So sometimes when you think there's more infections and you start testing more, well, the red is the increase in the testing. Now, look how they they up go, go hand in hand. Now, you do have a juncture here which does show, obviously, it was greater transmission. Uh, so it just isn't, it just is not because of just more testing. But at the same time, too, you have more testing and you have more cases being detected. It's kind of like a chicken and the egg scenario. All right, so here we look at this. The mortality rate is about 2.5 uh, per million. All right, and that's a pretty steep increase. But what does that compare to the United States? Let's put it in perspective. Every life is precious, so don't get me wrong. So we're just going to up to the United States, and somehow we forgot about Brazil. Um, look, India's at 2.5, Brazil's at 13. Now think about this. Brazil's not in the news, is it? But India is. All right. And so let's go back to the United States. Boom, boom, boom. So United States mortality rate currently, as we're heading out, is about the exact same as India. So here we have the tale of two cities two states. You have India and the United States. The United States went down to about 2.5. India went up to about 2.5 per million. What we have is doom and gloom in the media in reference to India. Uh, some sort of superfluous inflated stories by saying medics say this and this and that, which is not official data. Uh, creating fear and anticipation, which is not healthy. Uh, but yet, there's still they're about where we are going down, and we're talking about the pandemic in the past tense. Just something to think about. Again, data is data. Does not mean it can't get worse. I don't want to be responsible for you know uncertainty, but you know you can plan for uncertainty, but you can't live your life totally around uncertainty. That's the difference. Is we're not planning for uncertainty. We're living our life in anticipation of future uncertainties. So let's go back to the other data file. Let's just go, let's go straight to the vaccine rollouts because it's important as well. Here we go. All right, what this is right here is this, and this is gonna give you a little interesting information as well. This is your vaccine rollout. Now this is the Johnson & Johnson. And if you don't see your state here, let's make this a little smaller, please forgive me. Let's see if we can do this. And see if it comes up. Yeah, maybe a little easier to read. All right, so here we are. So this is your Johnson and Johnson. This is Moderna and your Pfizer. Now, for the data scientists out there, go well. Where is AstraZeneca? There's an interesting mystery. The CDC has kept great data on just about everything, but I want to show you this. AstraZeneca. No results. AstraZeneca. Let's try doing it separate. Let's do anything. Let's go. Boom. AstraZeneca. No results. Astra. Nothing. So basically, I have no data to give you in reference to AstraZeneca because it seems like no one at the CDC is collecting data on AstraZeneca. Uh, but they are collecting data on the other vaccines, but not AstraZeneca. So if you find it, Give me the API and link it, and I'll pull it down. But however, though, I have not seen any data in reference to AstraZeneca. And so if we look at the vaccines itself, this is the percentage of the population that should be vaccinated if everything was perfect. Right there. So that includes the Johnson & Johnson. That includes the Pfizer. And that includes the, uh, the Moderna. But again, we know there's a correlation between the vaccine you know, that's dropping. But however, though, again, numbers needed to vaccinate. Um, the absolute risk reduction is just sad all across the board. And the numbers to prevent one hospitalization, as we covered before, is just, you know, highly deficient. All right. So, again, you can you draw in a correlation. I mean, it's easy to correlate vaccines with disease drop, per se. Uh, but, however, though, you know, vaccine passport, that it may make a person feel good psychologically, but 
No. But all right, let's go write the rest of the data. Let's go back into the audits. Do, do, do. All right, here we go. Let's go new cases moved per million. All right, we want to get that. that. Uh, years United States. This is your drop down. This one began to drop in January. Now, again, think your vaccine rollouts, which started happening right around here or so. Uh, you had such a small percentage of the population. Uh, not necessarily really effective by that point in time. It was already dropping way ahead of time. In fact, the irony is when the vaccine started getting out more and more momentum, you actually have more of a flat line in reference to the um, into the cases per million. All right, so let's go down real fast. I'm going to pass by the states. Asia, that's India. Now look at this right here. That is the most amazing aspect. I usually am not used to seeing that sharp decline. All right, so I pull that up, and that is India. Then all of a sudden, now the cases sort of plummeting. Here's the United States versus all of Asia. And if we want to get the information here, just to see if we have it here. No, not there. Do, 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 do. Going down there. Uh, death per million, all of Asia. We know that's India. Uh, mortality of all of Asia. Here we are. Here's our data so far. This is the United States versus all of Asia. This gives you perspective. Asia total mortality. 521,782. Population, 4 billion. 463 million. Total mortality in the United States, 576,722. Population, 329 million. So when you see all those charts and those articles reference to what's happening in the rest of the world, uh, yet we're talking about the pandemic in past tense in the United States. Again, the language is very important. You have to keep in mind you have one fatality mortality per 8,553 which has the number has gone down but remember cumulative here compared to the United States one mortality per every 570 perspective all right here's the world right there this is all the information here's your vaccines people fully uh, fully vaccinated for 100 right there uh, new deaths moved per million new cases moved per million so we're looking at the, this is the deaths so you have a greater transmissibility you always had that uh, it seems like transmissibility was always increasing, but deaths always maintained pretty close to the bottom line overall when average to the rest of the world. There's a drop. There's a drop. It's going to be really interesting to see next week. There's a drop again. All right, let's go back past the heat map. Da -da -da. It's you know across the board. Look at that. All of a sudden, boom. Middle of the Look at how steep a drop that is. That's what... That's what just fascinates me. It's, it's like it's a numerical error more than anything else. Uh, but that drop is right there. And so we go down the list, down the list, do, 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 do. Here it goes. We're looking at what's purple here. Purple is new cases per million. Red is new deaths per million. That's freaky. Because you normally wouldn't see necessarily a correlation like that. That's... Let's see if those numbers hold uh, next week. That's bizarre. All right, there is obviously what was the greatest concern because of the higher transmissibility went up. New deaths went up without a doubt. Uh, and so there is the back line. And we just go through the rest of the things we saw already before as far as perspective. Uh, but that, let's, we'll follow that. Well, I don't think there's anything else. Like here's Europe. I just want to. Remember when Europe went through lockdowns and everything else like that once again? These drops seem to happen regardless of what happens. It's just that basically the virus, for example, even though it's not alive, has a mind in its own. But we are really going to have to revisit what we consider sentient. I know what we consider alive, but what is considered sentient? Uh, and it's a weird thing, way to think about it, but however, though, it's adaptable. Europe cases to mortality, it went down as well. All right, so let's go back over to correlations. There's our heat map. Eh, let's see, we go down real fast. That's actually, that's probably the most confusing heat map I've ever seen to date. So let's make sure we don't revisit that one again. Uh, let's see, down the list here. United States now moving up. Uh, do, 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 do mortality wise at 2.04. So again, we're actually going down pretty sophisticated. Uh, significantly when we first started it was at 3.6 went way high and now there's the United States and there is India so here it is think about this 
you have to look at basically again the media per se. I don't care what what's Fox, CNN. They are, they're all the same news pool. When they're all interviewing each other and you know, say this reporter says this, and they're, all they're doing is they're interviewing. They're just reporting on other reporters. And, you know, here you have the United States and India. The United States still has a slightly higher deaths per million than India, albeit every life is precious. But look how the media portrays India as opposed to the United States right now. It's intriguing, uh, the behavioral uh, manipulation. All right, let's go world mask. We went through that. Uh, Oxford University still hasn't updated their data yet, so I don't want to go back into the mass aspect because obviously when you have half the United States is basically – has no mask mandate, you really can't consider a policy stringency aspect of a four. All right, and yeah, I'm not seeing much change anywhere along those lines. So let's go hospital occupancy real fast. Here we are, California. There it is. It's like, it's like, as, as I don't know, what is the hospital occupancy in reference to inpatient beds being used by COVID people? All right, there's that. Uh, now there's New York. Uh, inpatient beds, inpatient beds used. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Man, remember, the reason I bring up these states more than anything else, Iowa, North Dakota, Montana, and so on and so forth, is because these states really had loose pandemic mitigation restrictions in the beginning. And remember, the whole object was to flatten the curve. And so basically, from a data science standpoint, looks like it's been pretty flat for quite some time. And so occupancy restrictions, mask restrictions, and so on and so forth. Don't get mad at me because, again, I'm not, I'm not validating them. It's just I don't have the data to validate it with. All right, let's see. Here's that. Do, do, vaccine delivery is perfect. COVID rebuild, we did that. Vaccine effectiveness. And let's look at the Monte Carlo model. Do, 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 New deaths. That's current, as we discussed, up to tonight. You know, we always see these really, really late at night. And keep in mind, too, this is in 4K. I want to reiterate, it takes a few days to, to basically for the resolution of the process to 4K. So just to keep in mind, if you're this far towards the end and everything's still blurry, it usually takes about eight hours to process from HD once I, once I actually print it. So about midday on May 2nd. And here is our total, obviously. Um, this was, I'm just making fun of the IHME because the way they do their predictions, but that's a cumulative. New case per million prediction. All right, this is where we're heading again, uh, based upon the current data as of August 30th, 2021. It should be pretty low at this rate. And of course, this is the date as of now. And this is the United States, May 2nd, 2021. So let's see if the Monte Carlo holds true. It may even go further down than that. New deaths per million, Monte Carlo. Again, this is May 2nd. We are at 2.02 .02 or something like that. And Monte Carlo, there is actually an area where we start flatlining on, please forgive the analogy, on zero, uh, I would consider that more of an outlier. But it looks like by August 30th, would you say that's the mean, uh, the average? It should be about a half a death per million, and that's usually individuals, so maybe contribute to a, a comorbidity. Uh, but often, a lot of the comorbidities uh, with COVID 19 is very few actual, just no other comorbidities associated with it. But there's always a higher association with comorbidity and, and unfortunately, mortality. Uh, so, who knows? I mean, I'm looking at basically, I'd like to see exactly a Monte Carlo based upon individuals that had no other underlying health conditions. Uh, that did not succumb to uh, COVID-19. That would I'd be most interested in. All right, but let's wrap it up. It's actually kind of early. Let's wrap it up with the news articles that we looked at. AstraZeneca, obviously we can't find it, but we can do, obviously do Pfizer. Let's it real fast. Do, 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 Let's see. Da, da, da. Let's see, there's your Pfizer allocations and things like that. That's the way it should show up. But AstraZeneca does not. There's Moderna, and you see all the other ones too on top of that. And why AstraZeneca is not being tracked by the CDC? I'll leave that for the conspiracy theorists. And let's go backwards. Cell study. Organophosphates, pesticide, individuals, areas which have higher pesticide concentrations. 
it'd be really curious for an epidemiologist now to do the homework and say, hey, is COVID-19 illnesses or mortality higher in areas which tend to have a greater density of pesticide exposure? Boom. Find out real fast. And if that's the case, then maybe, just maybe, one of the other pandemic mitigation strategies in reference to such an ailment like this that plays upon the ACE2 uh, receptors is to stop spraying pesticides in those areas during a pandemic. That's food for thought. You know, go organic. So here we go. Uh, Human to cat transmission. Yeah, I'd much rather see pesticides go away before people get rid of their their favorite um, companions. Diagnosis mismanagement. Again, of uh, did I say mismanagement? Yeah, I did. Please forgive me. That's publisher bias. Uh, in management of basically of um, you know the COVID nineteen whatever it is you know, CVST, uh, blood clots, and thrombocytopenia associated with vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia. I was trying to uh, make an acronym to it, but I failed. Uh, from the, the chimpanzee one or the human one, again, it gives a good explanation. And more often than not, that one line right there, all patients are suspect of CVST due to COVID-19 vaccine should be treated with non-heparin anticoagulants. So let's hopefully the healthcare professionals actually get a hold of that information. Remember during the Spanish flu, uh, I digress, but the Spanish flu, one of the main reasons there's had such a high mortality in the United States was because they prescribed up to eight grams to, th- uh, to 30 grams of aspirin per day. So you start wondering how much, how mortality plays a role in reference to treatment. So if heparin is papally, is possibly contraindicated in reference to treatment of um, individuals having difficulties with COVID-19, as a whole, uh, may this not also play a role with the vaccine as well? I mean, for example, if they say no heparin with COVID-19 vaccine uh, induce CVST, should heparin be prescribed? Now, heparin, ironically, uh, may help with uh, fight off part of the SARS-CoV-2. But otherwise, outside of that, should heparin be prescribed in individuals with COV, uh, with uh, COVID-19 as well, that even if it wasn't the result of the vaccine? Again, I don't know. I'd be really curious to find out. I'd like to see some information and guidance in reference to that. All right. Heat. Out of doubt one of the most profound research articles because simplicity and the the impact, the efficiency in such the easy, easy uh, execution of basically of a wonderful, simple, elegant, uh, eloquent uh, pandemic mitigation uh, tactic. Just simple heat at close to 160 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, not counting for other uh, variables per se, uh, and other ambient conditions, in less than a half a second. Again, the links will be there for you to follow. Gratitude, good night or good morning, I should say. This May 2nd, 2021, thank you for listening. And we'll do a few more of these uh, unless more information comes out. Uh, before we actually start to conclude or end the season of uh, COVID-19 videos. Uh, I don't want to do this for more than, you know, three or four more weeks if we're already on our way uh, out of this uh, scenario. Uh, But otherwise, outside of that, thank you for listening. I look forward to having you listen again next week. And uh, just gratitude. Thank you. And a lot of gratitude to the researchers who do the research Um, because, again, uh, they've developed incredible, incredible breakthroughs through this entire pandemic. And even if they were not incorporated in this pandemic per se, it really did, it will help in the future uh, mitigate or offset a lot of poten- other potential nasty stuff out there uh, fairly readily and maybe without the uh, attack on individual liberties. You know what I mean? Again, we're off to the off. Thank you, gratitude, and look forward to you all once again very soon. See you then. Bye.